Great. All right. Well, if, that, if that's the case, uh, we'll get started here. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this afternoon's program, Downsizing and Reverse Mortgages. Um, real estate broker, Helen Morgan, will explain where to begin when it comes to downsizing and the and trick intricacies of reverse mortgages. And the Q&A will be at the end of the presentation. So thank you everyone for coming. And, and Terry Brady as well is here to present. So without further ado, uh, the both of them, thank you. So the question is to move or not to move. That seems to be the never ending question as we go through the many transitions in our lifetime. What was once the perfect fit for the growing family is now just too much to manage. So how do we know when it is time to move? And what is the downsizing process? What are the options? Should we decide to stay in our home? Hello, I'm Helen Morgan, a local real estate broker that specializes in in providing answers and solutions to these very questions. As a certified senior housing professional and senior real estate specialist, I've had the privilege and the honor of helping many families through the downsizing process. My mission to make downsizing simple and stress-free for aging adults and their families by providing real estate solutions, resources, and education. And I'm assuming if you joined us today, you're here because you're contemplating this, these very questions. So I'm here to walk you through the process of downsizing and the options. Terry Brady will join us um, after this presentation, she will join us to help educate on reverse mortgages. So please hold your questions until the end of this session. Our goal is to equip and empower you with the information you need to make the right decision for your family. So how do you know when it is time to move? Well, the truth is, it's personal, and it sneaks up on all of us. A lot of people have said they feel an overwhelming feeling of anxiety, depression, even sadness at the thought, very thought of a move, especially after 20, 30, 40 years in the same home. It can affect us physically, as we become unable to keep up with the home and the maintenance of a yard, it can overburden us financially. On the flip side, maybe you just have started to see that there's more to enjoy in life. If you're not burdened with the large home and all the stuff that comes with it, you might be looking forward to what I like to refer to as right-sizing and enjoying your time. Here are the top seven obstacles I hear most from those contemplating a move. I'm not ready yet. It's all so overwhelming. This is the one I hear the most. We don't know where to begin. At least with this one, you're feeling optimistic and you just need some direction. I need to wait until my kids can help. Well, this one can be quite challenging. In many cases, our adult children are busy raising their own family, working full-time jobs, and may even live out of state. I often hear from my clients, we don't know, we don't want to burden our children. So you may even feel guilty about asking them for help. What will I do with all my stuff? We'll take a deeper dive into this one a little bit later on in the presentation. 
the thought of making these decisions scares me. Well, maybe you've recently lost a spouse, and this is the first time in many years you're having to make major life decisions on your own, and you don't know who to trust. And last, I'm not physically able to manage the move. This presentation is meant to help you through all of these obstacles, except one. Can you guess which one? Well, I'm sure you probably can. I can help with it and my team with everything, except I'm not ready yet. And why? Only because you can make that decision. You're the only one that can make that decision. Maybe your children or family, family members are concerned about your safety living alone and are encouraging you to make a move before there's a crisis. Maybe you've experienced a fall or health scare that has caused concern. Well, rightfully so. That's all fine, but ultimately it's your choice. You are in control of your life. Let's all raise a hand or just think these questions about these questions to yourself, whichever you're most comfortable with. How many of you currently have things in your home you no longer need or want? Who has, yes, I'm raising my hand too, Terry. Who has things they're storing that belong or belonged to someone other than themselves? And who has a spouse that keeps everything? Well, I am really waving on this one, I can tell you that. Um, who would say that it's all the stuff that keeps them from making a change in lifestyle? And lastly, who would like to know about some, some people and services that can help you deal with all the stuff that come when it comes time to move or to just downsize your life? Hopefully some of you have answered yes to this question because otherwise it's going to be a very short and or boring presentation. Another great reason to downsize your home is that you will be able to reduce the cost and time dedicated to maintenance and upkeep of your current home, giving you the opportunity to invest more time and money toward the things that are important aspects of your life. Overall, many times downsizing makes living more affordable for you. When you make a choice to live a better, more comfortable lifestyle, it really should be referred to as right-sizing. That's my favorite term. Okay, no judgment. No judgment here, please. Please don't judge. You see, I've started the downsizing process myself, and you're not alone. This downsizing process is something I work with my clients on every day. And I realize it's not easy and it can be overwhelming. Well, I have a funny story to share with you. At least I think it's funny. I hope you feel the same way. Not listening to my own advice, obviously from this photo on the left here, I decided to dive in head first into a room that wasn't used much. The grandchildren sleep in the room when they come over for sleepovers, so I thought it would be a great room since I wouldn't need to complete it right away. I could close the door and work on it when I, when I felt like it. Well, I started pulling everything out of the closet, hence the photo on the left. And when I did, Everything in that closet was um, 
trying to, I was trying to decide, you know, what to donate, what I should keep. So I'll just go through it all, and we'll leave it in the leave it in the room. The closet was packed full of photographs, which mean memories. And well, three hours later, I realized I could barely get up off the floor because I was looking through all the photographs for three hours. Big, big, big mistake, I must say. To tackle this at my, is my first project, and three weeks later, I'm still gradually going through these things. My grandsons came for a visit, and as I mentioned, this is the room they would stay in. The seven-year-old says to me, Grandma, that room is a mess. We wanted to have a sleepover, and of course, I had to say not tonight. I promised I'd get back, I'd get the room back in order and we'd have the sleepover next week. I did get it done, but it wasn't an easy task by any means. I was exhausted. We had our sleepover. When they were leaving, the seven-year-old Connor says to me, Grandma, try to keep that room straightened up. We might want to have another sleepover. <laughs> so now, every time they come by, they look, Connor looks in the room and he says, Grandma, great job on straightening up the room. I said, oh my, whatever you do, don't, don't do what I did. I took on too much at one time. It felt overwhelming with a deadline approaching. You need to start with bite-sized pieces. Make sure you set a time but more as a guide. Does this graphic give you, give you a clue to the overwhelmed feeling that most of us have when we take on too much? So start early. Downsizing takes time. Here's five steps to the right sizing process. The process may take a few weeks to upwards of a year or more. You have to create a plan for your process of sorting through your personal and household items and preparing for the next steps. Starting early will allow you to better plan out the process and will save you on the stress of not having to rush through the process, feeling overwhelmed. Step two. Make a plan. Create an outline of what needs to be done. This will help keep you organized and on track throughout the process. In your plan, you should detail and track your daily and weekly tasks to successfully downsize. Your plan should incorporate proactive measures that you should take that will allow your process to go a lot smoother. And step three, the sorting process. What to keep, what to sell, what to donate. This step will most likely be the most lengthy, time-consuming part of the downsizing process, depending on the amount of things in your home. We recommend you take your time and you don't try to rush through the process of sorting. You should go through and sort your things one room at a time Start with the drawer. Now, do not do what I did. Start with the drawer. Get it organized. Get it sorted. You'll feel so much accomplishment that you'll want to go on to the next step. And try to make it a comfortable place where you're sitting. You're not, you're not sitting on the floor or standing too long. Because most of all, you want to take breaks. Take breaks in between. You should go through and sort your things one room at a time. Take the necessary breaks throughout the process. A great tip is to have three bins, boxes, or bags, one, one for each for keep, a bag for what you're going to sell, or a box, a, donate, a donation box, and this has been a lifesaver for most of my clients, is keep a pad of sticky notes with you at all times.
for the larger pieces. Maybe you're going to give some to grandchildren, to children, nieces, nephews, whatever it might be. But you can put a sticky note on that piece, and then you know where it's going, what's happening with it, and you don't have to think about it any longer. Um, so that, that I have found to be a lifesaver for many. And step four. This is the next steps after you've made it through the sorting process. The next steps will be a lot less time consuming and stressful on your part. Time to pack up all the remaining items that you've decided to keep and focus on selling your home. We recommend working with a real estate broker to make the process of selling your home go a lot faster and smoother. And step five, which is very important, relax and enjoy. You successfully made it through the process. Take the time to relax and enjoy your new home. You deserve it. And here's the good news. Remember a few slides back? I asked you to sh 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 for a show of hands on who would like to know about some people and services that can help you deal with the stuff when it comes time to downsize. Well, there are a variety of specialists that I've had, I, I have personally vetted, trusted, and tested. I can, I can help you find the right specialist given the specific, your specific circumstance because every, every situation is different. Some of them, it may, they may be estate, estate liquidators, move managers, real estate professionals, movers, organizers. When to use a reverse mortgage. Now I'd like to introduce you to Terry Brady. Terry is a reverse mortgage professional that has been helping seniors analyze home equity funding solutions for the past eight years. She is a member of the National Aging in Place Council. We both are members of the Continuity of Care Network and the Aging Care Connections Committee. Okay, Kit, Terry, I am going to stop sharing my screen and it's all yours. Thank you, Helen. I so appreciate that. That was great information. And um, yes, I am one of those who needs to start doing that. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully this works right. But where is that present mode that you that I'm supposed to use? Helen, are you are you seeing more than just my my? Uh, are you seeing the side slides? Yeah, I don't know where that present mode is, but I'm just going to show this is. All right, can everybody hear me? I feel like, yeah. Um, so my name is Terry Brady. I am a reverse mortgage specialist. Um, I know that um, this is only one part of the puzzle that Helen is talking about in terms of downsizing, and that's the financing part of it. You know, how as a senior do you finance buying a new home? And that is where my specialty comes in. I'm just one of those many specialists that Helen was talking about. And it's, it is a complicated um, concept in a way. So today, I'm just going to ask that you come away with a couple things. One, that you're curious to learn more about the reverse mortgage process, um, that you are confident that this is something you can use and not be concerned. It's a very different product from that reverse mortgage that people were so scared of many, many years ago. It's no longer that, that same product. And to know that it is unique to people who are 62 and over. So this was especially made as a way for seniors, retirees, to be able to get financing to purchase a home or to basically get cash out of their home. So your home is no longer an illiquid asset. Rather, it is an asset that can create cash to either buy that new home or buy a second home or for any of your needs. Okay. 
So first of all, I'm going to go, like I said, through the basics, and then I'm going to um, lead that into how you can use it for your downsizing when um, you're working with someone like Helen. So your retirement goals, as we all um, retire, we share the goals of, you know, longevity, wanting to make sure our money lasts as long as we need it to, and we're all living longer. So for my mom, who we celebrated her 91st birthday on Saturday, it's a long time. So we're like, okay, you know, we need to really think about this. The five kids have to really think about how we're going to keep mom going in the lifestyle that she enjoys. And, you know, that's good for everybody. We all want to stay active. We all want to continue to see our grandkids, to travel, to go to restaurants, that type of thing. Um, we want to be able to have the liquidity so that if we do have emergencies, if we need a new roof, if we need in-home health care, we want to be able to have the cash to do that as well. And of course, we would still like to have a legacy and leave things to our charities, to our children, to our grandchildren, and that type of thing. And those are all overwhelming financing needs, but it is something that we are all having to address now as we live longer. Um, you know, your biggest asset is probably your home. For most people in retirement, they've owned their home for many, many years. Um, and they've seen the equity in their home grow. So there's a lot of money that they have in this house, and they're saying, how do I get access to it, or what do I do? You know, if you've lived in a house a long time, and now you're looking at downsizing, you may have bought that house for, you know, $50,000 30 years ago, and now, you know, Helen can sell it for you for 300000 And so you've got a lot of equity in that, and you want to be able to access that. Selling the house is the best way to access it in terms of getting all the money out of it. But what are you going to do going forward now in terms of buying that new home? And that's where I would like to talk about how the reverse mortgage can be used to help you buy that new home. Um, but before we get into that, let's um, also talk about a few other things. As you're getting older and you need the cash flow, um, you know, people that I've talked to said, well, I need a little extra cash, whether it's to keep my current home going or to go into a new home. And your options are, you know, getting a job, selling your home, which is what we just talked about, maybe even refinancing your current home, especially given that interest rates are so low right now. Um, but, you know, the option I'm going to talk about today is getting a heck of a loan. And I bring this up because the reverse mortgage is often referred to as an HECM. And that is confusing to people because they'll be reading about an HECM and they won't realize it's really the same thing as a reverse mortgage. So what is the HECM loan? It stands for Home Equity Conversion Mortgage. So it is taking your home and converting it into cash. Few things you should know. It is a government insured home loan. So it's an FHA product that um, was started back in the 1980s, basically, but it comes as a government insured product. It is only for people who are 62 and over. It is normally referred to as a reverse mortgage loan. And the key is that there are no monthly mortgage payments. So it is a mortgage that you're taking out. It is a lien on your home but there are no monthly mortgage payments. So that's something that you have to keep in mind as you're looking, whoops, I got too fast there. Um, as you're looking at buying that new home, you should ask yourself, if I'm going to have to take out a mortgage, do I want to do the typical mortgage, the regular mortgage, conventional mortgage that most people have used, where I will have to have payments every month if I'm going to be borrowing money, or do I want to look at the reverse mortgage where I'm buying, I mean, I'm borrowing the money, but I will not have the monthly mortgage payments. So the advantage of the reverse mortgage, I mentioned the fourth one here first, you do not have the monthly mortgage payments. You do stay on title. Many people have this misconception that once you do a reverse mortgage, the bank owns your house. That is so not the case. That's never been the case. It's just this uh, concern that people have because they feel like they're not making payments and they've lost their house. No, it is a mortgage. You own it. 
You just have a lien against your house, just like with a conventional mortgage. Because it is government insured, you will never owe more than what your house is worth. It's called a non-recourse loan. So FHA is the one that will make sure that you never owe more than what your house is worth. The only stipulation is that you pay your property taxes and insurance. And as long as you pay your property taxes and insurance, you stay in the home. No matter if you end up owing more than what the house is worth, you will still stay in your home. So you are protected with the stipulation that you can pay your property taxes and insurance. And that is something that I go through to make sure that you can afford to do that before you get the reverse mortgage. So oftentimes when you're looking at a conventional mortgage, they look at how much your income is and that tells them, the bank, how much you can borrow. Well, now we're talking about working with seniors, right? So seniors don't really, don't typically have that much income. They no longer have the job. So what determines how much you can borrow then on this HECM or reverse mortgage? It does not have to do with your income at all. It has to do with your age. What the government is basically saying is, let's run the numbers and figure out how long you're gonna be staying in that house. If you're 90 years old, they're willing to lend you a lot more money as a percentage of the value of your home than if you're only 62, because obviously they're looking at how long you're gonna be living in that home. So the older you are, the more or the higher percentage of the house you can borrow against your home. They look at what equity you have in your home because if you currently already owe money on the house, we have to take that into consideration. If you already owe, if you haven't paid off your house yet, that doesn't mean you can't get a reverse mortgage. You can still get one, but we first have to look at, well, you already owe you know, 20% on your house. So therefore we have to pay that off and look at how much more we, you, you are eligible to then borrow above that. Other big factor, of course, is how much your, your house is worth because everything is a percentage of the value of your home. So let's say your house is worth 200,000. So at the age of 60, you can, you know, let's say borrow 50% of that value, 100,000. Whereas if you're 90, you can probably borrow about 70% or 70,000 of the value of that home. And then the last factor is interest rates. And right now interest rates are very low. So that really works in your favor in terms of being able to borrow a large percentage of the value of your home. So how does this money get dispersed? Because really this is like a home equity for many of you that have maybe gotten a home equity in the past, you're borrowing the value against your home. And um, it's different from the home equity in the sense that you're not making those monthly mortgage payments, okay? It's also different in the sense that um, you can take the money out and use it all up front in a lump sum payout which is how I'm going to talk about it in terms of how Helen and I would work together. Because you would take out that lump sum payment and use it to pay for the house that you're downsizing to. If you weren't necessarily looking at buying a new house or um, you could just stay in your current house and that line of credit can be used as an annuity in the sense that you would get a certain amount of money every month or you can just pull it out as you need it. So going back to my example, if you have a house that's worth 200,000, and let's say you're 80 years old, and you can borrow up to about 60% of that, you could get a $120,000 line of credit on that house. And then you have that money sitting there for peace of mind for when you need it. For those of us in Cook County, a lot of us, a lot of my clients use it to pay for extra taxes, real estate taxes. They get along just fine when life is going smoothly every month, but when they get that extra tax bill, they pull on that line of credit to pay off their real estate taxes. Or they may use it if they need in-home health care. 
they may have a fall and they now need 24 hour care, they'll pull on that line of credit to then get the um, money to pay for in-home health care. So basically what you do is you set up this mortgage up front, this line of credit up front, and it's available to you when you need it to pay for any extra expenses. You can also use it to buy a second home, which is where Helen would come into play. If you have a nice house now where you've built up equity, let's say you have a house that's worth you know, $400,000 and now you see a nice condo down in Florida that you wanna buy for 100,000, you can borrow against your current house to then go out and buy that place in Florida and use it as the cash coming out of your house that's here or, or up in Wisconsin or wherever you may want to buy a second home. So it's very much turning your illiquid asset of a house into some cash, okay? What I'd like to do, I'm gonna share a different screen now because I wanna show how this, in a practical term, how it works when you're downsizing. And I'm gonna say this in a couple of different ways because I know it's overwhelming when you're talking about numbers and I'm not here to be able to write on a board or something, which is what I normally do when I'm in person. Um, so I made this chart because when you're looking to buy a new home, when you're looking to downsize, I always think of it as three different options. Okay, purchase, these are three columns here. Purchase plan number one, purchase plan number two, and purchase plan number three. So Helen has found you this beautiful home you're gonna move into. Your first purchase plan would be, well, we're gonna pay in cash. We're downsizing. So you're selling that $400,000 home, you're buying a $200,000 town home. So you can pay in cash, right? And you can put that extra 200,000 in the bank and you're just gonna pay it all in cash. You don't have any payments. Your house rich, maybe a little cash poor because you put it all into the house. Um, and it sort of limits the amount of house you can buy because you wanna to go to something smaller, right? Now I'm gonna to go to purchase plan number three because that's another typical purchase plan where you're going to go out and get a mortgage on it. Now this is assuming that you qualify for a mortgage, which you could maybe if you have enough income from your investments or if you're still working in your retirement or not retired yet, I should say, then you can go out and get a traditional mortgage, but you will have payments on that mortgage. And so that becomes a concern because what if you lose your job or what if you decide you wanna retire and your income goes down or what if one of you passes away, which is a very common incidence for my clients. They go from two incomes to one income in their retirement and that mortgage payment has become a huge burden. So it is an option to go with a traditional mortgage, but it really becomes um, overwhelming in the sense of the what ifs. So what if I lose my job? Or what if one of us passes away? Okay, you've kept a lot of your money in savings, but now you're really hit with that monthly mortgage payment. And it all will depend on how much income you're making to qualify for that mortgage. So where I come in is purchase plan number two. And this is not something a lot of people really understand or know about. So as I said, I'm just going to sort of um, tweak your curiosity today. And, you know, it's something you can learn more about. Um, there are books to read online, etc. And, you know, people are available to explain it, including myself. But let's go with the concept. Remember when I said before that it all depends on your age? So let's say we're talking about somebody who's 70. And just for simplicity, let's say with the reverse mortgage in today's interest rate environment, with a 70 year old, that they can borrow 50% of the value of a home. So if you find a house with Helen, let's say that's worth $200,000, the town home that's worth 200, you don't have to pay $200,000 in cash. You don't have to go out and get a mortgage for that 200,000. You can pay half in cash. You can just pay half, pay 100,000. Borrow the other 100,000 on the reverse mortgage. You will not have a monthly mortgage payment. You will be able to take that extra 100,000 and put it in the bank. Or if you want, 
If you have 200,000, you can go out and buy a 400, you know, a bigger house because now you know you can borrow half. So it increases the amount of house you can buy. You could buy, go from a 400,000 to a 300,000 instead of the 200,000 because you can now borrow half. You can borrow the 150 and just pay for 150,000 in cash. So it increases the amount of house you can buy once you're downsizing. So now the question becomes, and I know many of you are thinking, well, I'm not making mortgage payments. Yeah, what's the government doing? Lending me free money? No, 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 no. They would never do that. But what they are doing is they're being very, um, they're allowing you to look at this as a loan that you can pay off when you move out of the house, which quite frankly, for most of my clients means they passed away or they've gone into the nursing home or assisted living. So you're borrowing that money. So let's say you borrowed 100,000 in a reverse mortgage. Interest rates are very low right now. So we're talking about 3%. So think of it like a credit card that you're not making any payments on. As you get your credit card statement every month, if you don't make any payments, that amount you owe goes up over time. The same thing happens with the reverse mortgage. The amount you owe goes up every month. The biggest difference is that you're only being charged 3% interest. Whereas with the credit card, you're being charged 12, 15, whatever. So it gets really big, really fast. But with the reverse mortgage, it's a very gradual going up. It's dependent, you know, on the interest rate. Then you can, many of my clients, you know, they live in their house 10, 20 years. So it's only when they die and pass away that that mortgage is then paid off. If they passed away, then whoever has inherited the house chooses, if they choose, they can stay in the house. They just have to pay off the reverse mortgage. But most of the time, the children don't want to move in the kid's house anymore. And instead, what they'll do is they'll sell the house, pay off what that current mortgage, reverse mortgage loan balance is, and then they inherit the rest of it. So the conception that people have lost their house or that the kids no longer get any money is not true, but it does depend on how long you've lived in that house. If you should pass away or move after three or four years, then there is going to very much be equity left in the house. But if you lived in the house for 20 years and what you borrowed of 100,000 has now grown you know, many, many, many times, it may be worth more than what the house is worth. And that's where FHA comes in because they insure it so that you never owe what's more than the house is worth, which means your kids are not on the line for anything. And if you haven't lived in the house that long, then your kids will still inherit whatever is left after they've paid off the reverse mortgage. So I know that that's a lot of thought, <laughs> a lot of information. But I want you to come away with the fact that it is, like I said, very much an option to think about. Um, you can use this as a planning tool for, the t for when you're thinking about how much you can afford to buy. I had, um, I had two sisters that were living in Missouri and they had a house in Missouri that, you know, they felt like they wanted to be closer to family here and they came up here and they were looking in, in um, Oak Lawn to buy a house last year. And they found a $300,000 house they really liked, but they had just sold their house in Missouri for only 200. And they're like, what are we gonna do? And so the realtor knew about this and they said, well, you can borrow half of it. So borrow the 150 and just use 150 of the 200 you sold your other house for. And you can, and you still have 50,000 left over for any, you know, concern, you know, to put in the bank. So it is very much a tool to have, to look at different ways to finance when you're downsizing. Most people traditionally think of the reverse mortgage as a way to create cash out of their current house. And that is very much a way that people have used it traditionally, but in these new developments, especially the 55 and older developments, Whenever someone is moving, 55 is long, you have to be 62, but whenever someone is moving into those developments now, oftentimes the developer himself or the realtors who are selling them say, 
you know, you should really look at a reverse mortgage. You don't have to pay cash for these places. Look at a reverse mortgage to finance your new purchase on your new downsizing. Because it is very much a viable alternative if you're planning on staying in this house forever. Because you don't have to make any payments for a very long time, or you don't make any payments at all. And you are basically using that cash that's in the house to stay in the house rather than leaving it to your children. I mean, that is something you have to become comfortable with. You're using the cash in the house for you while you're living rather than paying cash so that your kids can have all that cash in the future. That's, I would say, is the one thing you need to be comfortable with is you are using the cash yourself now. So that is about it, Helen. I'll take this down and stop sharing so that if we have questions, we can address any questions. I don't know if Duke's coming back or if you want to go ahead. Yourself. I'm here. I'm here. I'll look okay. uh, at okay. the chat and Q&A and Q &A see if anything comes through. So yes, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat box. Um, I will be looking at both. Or if you have any suggestions on how to improve our presentation, we're always looking for advice, suggestions. Terry, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I wasn't sure. Um, when when someone is looking, I mean, and I think that this is something, again, I think you explained it very well, and thank you very much for that. But I think maybe some people still really don't understand if they are going to be moving from their home, how they're able to take out a reverse mortgage on the house if they're not keeping it. Does that make sense? Or would they have to be keeping that particular house, that house? And looking okay, like so you're, you're right. Okay, so there's two different scenarios. When you're downsizing, the reverse mortgage is on the new house. So you're borrowing money on the new house. Not on the house you're selling. The other scenario is when you're not downsizing and you're in a house and you're borrowing money on your current house. So you always have to be borrowing the money on your principal residence. Okay, I think you clarified it. You know, I just want to make sure that- Did I? I know it's very confusing, but it is always on your principal okay. residence. Okay, so we now have three questions. Um, all right, so we have, how would a reverse mortgage affect your income going into a healthcare facility? Yes, good question. And I've had this um, situation. It does not, well, there's a couple of things. So basically, um, putting aside Medicaid, okay, it is not considered income when you take money out of your house. So, um, Typically what my clients have done is they hire in-home health care, stay in their current home until they run out of cash. And then at that point, they will move into assisted living, sell their house, move into assisted living, and use cash that they have left over after they've sold, they've sold their home, paid off their reverse mortgage. They still have some cash left. They'll use that for their initial payment of their assisted living. So it really doesn't affect, the income does not affect the assisted living at all. It may affect qualification for Medicaid in the home. So we always make sure that any money you're taking out, like my, I have clients who pay 8,000 a month for in-home care. So the 8,000 a month comes into their checking account at the beginning of the month and it goes right out to their in-home health care. So therefore, they're always below that um, statutory amount that they cannot have above to, in order to qualify for Medicaid. Don't know if that's exactly what they were asking. 
there are many nuances about that, but it doesn't really affect, it's not considered income, it's just taking cash out of your house. Okay, and the, the next question is, so is a reverse mortgage like a home equity loan, but you are deferring the payments? Great question. Um, there is very similar to a home equity loan. The differences are with a home equity loan, qualify on the amount you qualify for depends on your income because you have to make payments. So on a senior citizen making usually, you know, let's say 1500 on social security and a hundred thousand dollar house, they may only qualify for, you know, $20,000 in a home equity loan because it's based on how much of a payment they can make. So, um, so the amount they'll qualify for with the home equity loan is much lower. Whereas with reverse mortgage, it's dependent on their age. So if they may qualify for 15,000 on a home equity and they're qualified for 50,000 on a reverse mortgage. With the home equity, they'll have to make a payment with the reverse mortgage, they do not. With the home equity, there is a 30, I mean, it can be 30 years oftentimes, um, with a reverse mortgage, there's no maturity. It's just when you're no longer living in the home. Um, and what we saw in 2008, when the, stock, when the real estate market fell, was that many home equity loans were frozen. With a reverse mortgage, once it's set up, nobody can take it away. And not only that, but it gets larger. So that was a nuance I didn't mention. But when you qualify, when you set up your reverse mortgage, and let's say you qualify for that $50,000 line of credit, if you don't use it, it gets larger over time, which is another benefit. Okay. Um, we have somebody who said, confused about what you were talking about with the sisters only having 200000 but the house was more. So I'm saying that they walked away from selling their house in Missouri with 200000 in cash. So they thought they could only buy a house here that was worth 200000 and once the realtor explained, no, you can still borrow money even though you don't have income. They realized they could buy a house that was worth more than 200 and just borrow the other 100 with the reverse mortgage. They were assuming they were gonna have to pay cash for it and that all they could buy was a $200,000 house. So what I'm saying is that the reverse mortgage opens you up to being able to borrow even though you don't really have income. You can borrow based on your age. Okay, so it's, it's definitely a, 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 you know, a senior product that lets you borrow money based on your age. And you're going to pay it back later when you move out of the house or you know, sell the house. That's when the government gets paid back. So it's sort of like, I mean, it is FHA allowing you to have sort of a loan that doesn't have payments on it. It makes a big difference. And it makes a big difference, yeah. being able to qualify. Many people would not have the income based to qualify for the additional 150000 they needed to move to Oklahoma as opposed exactly. to Missouri. Exactly. Right. They were moving from, a very, from Missouri where things were much less expensive. So Helen, do you find when people downsize, do most people pay cash? In most cases, they do. They do. Yes. Um, you know, in in this area, I mean, they're not looking for something larger. In most cases, you know, if they're staying in the area, and of course, this is the area I work. So, yes. Know, in most cases, they do pay cash, and um, you know, anymore with the prices of homes, I mean, this is a great product area. I mean, it's a great option for for many people that would be able to really move where they'd like to move. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. looking for something, worry, worrying about the cost. Exactly. Right. Right. Um, can a reverse mortgage be paid off ahead of time? Yes. You can always make payments on the reverse mortgage. A lot of people do that. They're like, you know, right now I can make payments. So even though I borrowed money to buy this house, I can make payments on it right now because I'm still working. So yes, there's no prepayment penalty, nothing. They, they'd love it if you started paying it back. Um, but it's always there. It's not like it can be taken away from you. So if they set you up for this line of credit at 100000 and you're making payments on it and it's getting lower, you can re-borrow it later, which people do. 
they pay it off while there's still two people in the house. And then um, it gets lower and low. I mean, you know, the amount they can borrow, because borrow gets higher. And then when one of them passes away, that amount is available for them to take out again. So it's a good planning tool from that standpoint. Financial planners look at it as a planning tool. Yes, good question. Houses yeah. where one may need to go into an assisted living. Um, yes, and, you know, and, and that's a good point too, Helen. If only one goes into assisted living, you still live in the house. You can still live in the house. You don't both have to be in the house anymore. And I've had that situation come up. Mm -hmm. So you can have a reverse mortgage without having a primary loan? Well, it is a loan. It is a loan. The reverse mortgage is a loan. That's the way to think about it. It's just a different type of loan. It's a loan without payments. Yeah. But you can only get it if you're 62 and over. So, yeah. And eventually it will be paid back. And it will be paid back when you sell the house. Right. Whoever is being, who is selling it, you or someone else. Mm -hmm. So I think those are, those are all the questions so far, unless we have any last minute ones at the end here. Um, but I do want to, I do want to thank um, Helen and Terry for doing this presentation. The Oldham Park Library thanks you. Um, we'll, we'll give it a minute here to see if there's any last minute questions. But thank you both for doing this. We appreciate yeah. it. You're welcome. Thank you for, for um, being so, you know, innovative and in, in giving these presentations while we're in the middle of this pandemic. <laughs> it's a great way to reach out to people. It really thank is. you. And Thanks. We appreciate the opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Looks like that might be it. So okay. in that case, um, I will end the session. Oh, no, we, how can we access your presentation? So um, we will be posting this to our Facebook and I believe our YouTube channel. Um, so you can view this. Um, if there's any other uh, links that you have, Helen and Terry, I, I could possibly um, dish that out as well. You know, it, actually, Duke, if you if you just want to send, um, you know, if you're, it's going to be on Facebook and if it's going to be on, make it so that um, we're able to share the link, um, you know, as the Orland Park being the sponsor, mm -hmm. that would be wonderful. Well, absolutely. I will email the link to you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. And contact, oh, they are curious about contact info. Yeah, I can go ahead and put it um, in the chat. I'm just gonna put it myself. Um, okay. I can do both. I, um, I tend to answer my phone for everything. Um, Did I do that right? Oh, a dot com. I did a little typo there. Oh, and actually, that is to all panelists. So you got to open it up to. Um... Oh, you're right. I got to open it up to everyone. Thank you. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Attendees, thank you. See how naive we are on this stuff? Good. Don't worry about it. So that is located in the chat, everyone. Not the Q&A, the chat. Okay, I did that in the chat. Yeah, I hope you can yeah. see that. There you go. And that looks right. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Good. And I'll leave that up for people to take pictures slash uh, write down for a good okay. minute here. Yeah. Yeah. So is your library open, Duke, now or no? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, we require okay. masks and we are open. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Do you have maximum capacity or is it pretty much all open now? Um, it, it, it's changed so much. Let me see here. Um, we, we've had steady numbers, so I don't think maximum has been an issue. Um, I can't even recall, to be honest with you. I, I've been, I've been, in, you know, back here in the office area for so long. Um, so I'm not sure the exact policy right now, but it, it's probably on our website. Yeah, yeah. 
-hmm. And so, yeah, that should be perfect. Thank you both again uh, okay. so much. Um, I will email you the links once they are posted. Um, our graphics department takes care of that. So as soon as it is posted, I'll send them your way. Thank you. All right, Jake. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Ellen. And thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, all the attendees. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.